Eileen, welcome to the Health Path podcast. It's really lovely to, to connect. Yeah, thanks for having me, Alex. Yeah, I was just saying um, off air how I read one of your books. I actually got it for a Christmas present this year um, and very quickly digested it. It was just one of those books that deeply resonated, I think, and makes an awful lot of sense and was something that um, I really wanted to, to speak to you more about and also to share it with sort of our listeners. So before we dive into it all, are, are you happy to just provide a little bit of a background into to who you are and, and how you got to where you are? Sure. Uh, well, where I am right now is Burlington, Vermont, and uh, I'm in my, my headquarters. We have a, a clinic and an office and a warehouse here. Um, we do sound therapy tools and training. And it all <clears throat> began with very humble beginnings. Back in 1996, I was doing massage therapy part time. And I love to read and research. And starting at 18, I just started devouring self help books, uh, science and spirituality, uh, really discovered that I had a passion for health and human potential and couldn't really get enough. And my journey led me into vibrational medicine and the use of color and sound and music in healing, which really resonated for me. It made sense to me that if all of creation is fundamentally vibrational and we're vibrational, then treating vibration with vibration uh, just seemed you know, like logical <laughs> to me. <laughs> so I read every book I could find at the time. And then I got a catalog in the mail uh, that had a set of tuning forks for healing in it and ordered it on impulse and started playing with the forks with my massage therapy clients. And in very short order, uh, my massage therapy practice, which was relatively new, uh, morphed into a sound healing practice because I discovered, even though I didn't know what I was doing, you know, a lot of people say to me that they have tuning forks, but they don't know what to do with them. And I had tuning forks and I didn't know what to do with them either, but I'm one of those people who's willing to just jump in, play, see what happens, see what I notice and discover. Um, I'm not afraid of doing things wrong. And so, you know, and there was, there was very little precedent for what was right uh, back then. So they, the tuning forks really captured my attention and because they were so intriguing and so puzzling and so fascinating and didn't behave in the way that I thought that they would behave. And, you know, I'm one of those people that buys a supplement, takes it for three days and then forgets about it. <laughs> I'm sure that a lot of people can relate to that. Yeah. Um, if I, or if I pick up a book and it doesn't grab me, you know, in the first few pages, I'm done. Uh, so I have a kind of short attention span, but it's been 28 years now that I have been playing with the forks, learning from the forks, listening to the forks, and they have taught me so much, just so they've given me so much insight into the human mind, the human spirit, the human body, the human electrical system, which I didn't know we had and kind mm -hmm. of with the fork interactions with the body sort of teased out that we have an electrical system that we're never taught about and it's extremely responsive to sound and i also discovered that we're basically self-tuning instruments that are designed to be in harmony but very few of us were treated like a stradivarius you know <laughs> most of us have gone through life getting taking a lot of hits and getting pretty beat up and have dents and dings and uh, bad habits and difficult patterns and emotional baggage. And it's all contained in our electrical system. And I basically figured out how to groom the body's electrical system, rewire it uh, and help induce a state of regulation uh, using a simple tuning fork, which is kind of, kind of wild. Um, I started teaching it in 2010 and we've trained over 3,000 students at this point. So there's lots of biofield tuning practitioners around the world who are practicing this. And it's such a simple and easy practice. You know, people always, uh, you know, feel like, oh, it's some kind of subtle or mysterious or, you know, how do you treat this or how do you treat that? 
Um, but the actual process of biofield tuning is one of simply uh, using a tuning fork to comb through the biofield. So the biofield um, I discovered <laughs> is actually a torus. And in this model, the, our electrical system, our biofield, same thing, um, it, it forms a torus with a central channel down the middle. So this is where your body would be. So in this model, your body is actually inside your mind. Because I would say that your electrical system is your conscious mind, where your thoughts happen, your feelings run through you, there are electrical patterns. It's our subconscious mind, it's where all our memories are stored. And what I actually discovered was that I could access people's memories by combing a fork through the atmosphere around their body. And actually mapped this field, discovered that there's a whole anatomy and physiology to the body's the current that runs through the body and the magnetic field that surrounds it. Um, so that's a big part of my work is what we call the biofield anatomy map. And this sort of pattern recognition with many thousands of clients over the years um, that particular imbalances mentally or emotionally would show up in very specific regions of the body. And, and this just repeated itself over and over again. Like everybody who came in to see me who had right hip pain had a tendency to overthink, to overdo, to have a busy mind. Um, they were always projecting themselves out into the future or running to-do lists. They just weren't in the present moment and grounded. They were pitched to the, to the right side. Um, everybody who came in with left shoulder pain had heavy sadness or grief there that they hadn't digested, processed, expressed, and so on through the whole body. And, uh, and we discovered that, that we could treat things like anxiety. You know, if you think about anxiety, what is it? It's rhythmic, right? It's a rhythm that's flowing through your electrical system. And a tuning fork acts like a metronome. So when you introduce a steady, coherent rhythm in, and reflect it back to the body, the body becomes aware that it is off rhythm. And it will actually use the tuning fork to bring itself back into a healthy rhythm, it's that self-tuning thing that we do. Depression is tonal. Uh, when people are depressed, I can often hear it off the left shoulder. You hear the undertones accented in the fork and again the body's like wow i'm i'm kind of low <laughs> and it <laughs> will use that input to adjust itself um, pain yeah. is very often too much current running through the wire because of a mental or emotional imbalance and the tuning fork acts like a magnet i can actually find magnetic blobs in the field where we've made energetic deposits into some unbalanced frame of mind and do what we call an adjustment. When we comb in through the field, we find these areas of imbalanced energy and actually use the tuning fork like a magnet to bring that energy back to the center of the body, back into a more neutral orientation, which makes it a lot easier. You know, when people are trying to shift their habits, it's hard because we're wired with particular behavior. And mm -hmm. very often it's hard to get out of your own way because you just default to the the regular programming and so this is a way of inter literally interrupting those habits those patterns in the in the mind and making it easier to flow along new pathways that are more balanced so it works i would say the number one thing that the tuning forks really work for is getting people unstuck okay because right one of people why do people look for anything or they go see a practitioner go buy a supplement or see a doctor is because they're stuck with a problem that they can't solve themselves and it might be mental emotional physical relational but it, it's like i can't get out of this stuckness that i'm in and i need someone to help me get my rubber on the road so i can get on with my life mm. and uh and so so that's really what it does i I know for many years when I had a really busy practice, uh, I would feel like a tow truck driver at the end of the day. And I've just been <laughs> pulling people out of ditches all day and helping them to get on track and expand into their potential, right? Because everybody knows that they have a lot more potential than most of us are, are realizing in ourselves mm -hmm. and in our lives. 
And that potential is electric potential. And it's all jammed up in your electrical system, stuck in resistance and noise and trauma responses. And, uh, and it can be liberated and put back into flow, um, which, you know, then the creativity starts flowing and, uh, you know, people start living a better life for themselves. Beautiful. Yeah, the, the idea of, I guess, um, health being free flowing energy, it's something that's come up in the podcast a few times and just feels like it, it kind of makes sense, like just feeling that sense of energy flowing freely is surely what we're always trying to achieve ultimately. And really most alter alternative and holistic practices do that in your chiropractic, get your skeleton and structural mm. integrity. So everything flows and works properly. Acupuncture, doing the same thing, unjamming places, redirecting energy. Uh, cranial sacral work is all about getting everything fluid and moving. Mm. Uh, pretty much anything that you look at is trying to help relieve the jam ups in the system so that the body can can be optimized. Right. So with the I was really hoping to have had a session. So I've actually there's actually a practitioner 12 miles from me, which is brilliant. Um, but I, well, our diaries didn't sort of align yet. So when a practitioner is using the tuning forks, is it is it an auditory thing that they're picking up on? Is there other are there other parts or other things that a practitioner is sort of able to, to detect, which would then lead to sort of the treatment? Mm -hmm. Well, we use uh, we use weighted forks on the body, right? So this is a weighted tuning fork, as opposed to this, which is an unweighted tuning fork, and uh, and I invented these amplifier boots that. Uh, that trap the sound and, and amplify it. So I use this like a stethoscope. And what I'll do is somebody comes in and lies down, put it on the bottoms of their feet, the sides of their knees, their hips, their sternum. And, and I'm reading the vibrational quality of the energy that's moving through each area. Okay. So if somebody is sort of energetically disconnected from their left foot, a lot of people, their energy is just like from here up. Not a lot of people out there at the moment who are really grounded or really open in their lower energy centers. And so I can tell if I put this on the bottom of your left foot and it feels sluggish and weak, and then I put it on the bottom of your right foot and it feels sort of hyper. And I will ask you to pay attention. I'll be like, feel that on that foot, feel this on this foot, and you can feel the difference. Mm. And just by bringing your attention to the imbalance and stimulating it, right? So I'm using it diagnostically to feel what's going on, but also therapeutically by putting in energy, right? okay. coherent energy. And, and that puts energy into the body. It wakes things up. It brings things alive. It starts things moving. So each place I go to, I invite you to be somatically aware of the, the conversation between that part of your body and the fork. So just in that beginning process, that awareness, your body starts using the input to adjust itself. It's like a biofeedback, really. Right. Uh, and, then, and then the sort of primary... Thing that biofield tuning is is what we call field combing where we go out to the outer edge of your field because remember it's a torus so it has a boundary so we come in and we find that edge and then we start to slowly move in from there and in the biofield anatomy what we encounter at the outer edge is gestation and then birth is just inside of that and sort of like dropping a needle on an album and reading the vibrational record of your life so all of your memories are accessible here. And let's say that you've got right knee pain and we're working on your right knee. The right knee, when people often, and not 100% of the time, but very, very often, um, when we have right knee issues, we're being blocked moving forward. We're inclined to move in this direction, but either somebody or something from the outside is blocking us, or we had such a pattern of that in childhood that we've become our own self-sabotager or blocker mm -hmm. and so we'll often as we go through find all of these times in your life where you had significant obstruction um, that was when i moved to to a new country and i didn't speak the language and i couldn't understand and i really struggled 
you know, <laughs> and, and where are you now? Oh, I just moved to a new country and I can't speak the language. So the, these patterns uh, show up and, and the ages do too. And it's very interesting the way the ages work, because if I'm working with somebody who's 60, uh, their field extends about six feet around, you know, okay. through front sides. Um, I'm going to find memories that were generated when they were 30, about three feet away from them. I'm going to find memories that were generated recently close by. And if I'm working on a 12 year old field is the same size. I'm it's like the hard drive just doesn't has less data in it, basically. So I'll find memories from when they were five or of six about three feet away. So as we age, we just kind of fill up the hard drive with information and it's all electrical, right? Because everything that you see and smell and touch and taste and feel and respond, these are all electrical impulses in your body. So it makes sense that it's stored in your electrical system in what I see to be standing waves. And so not only can we find the, the disruptive inputs, but just by staying in them. And that's what we do. We just look for a place where, oh, fork got all wonky and it's sort of stuck. And we just stay there. And we just keep on activating the fork and giving the body that reflection and that steady rhythmic input. And it adjusts itself, usually releasing some kind of subconscious tension that's in the body, right? So I'm going to block in the body, but is in the field because it's tied to that memory and that input and that experience that we never release. We're still in it. Mm. So, the, so this leads to inflammation in the body. Any place where we have historic jam ups or bad mental or emotional habits, um, then you end up with an imbalance of the way electricity is flowing. If you end up with an excess, it gets hot, right? That's inflammation. And anytime you have an excess in one place, you end up with a deficiency somewhere else. So this is all electrical. And, and, it, and magnetic fields guide and inform uh, electric currents. So we're actually adjusting the way electricity is flowing through the body by adjusting the magnetic field. Okay. It's amazing. And I think that principle that, you know, we are electric. I mean, we sort of know it, but we don't know it when we think, I think you even say that in your book, you know, there are machines in hospitals that we'll get connected to, to, to monitor some of these things, but we don't necessarily think in our day to day lives, how we're electric. Um, and that was such a big part, I think, for me of the, certainly the first part of the book, just getting a deeper understanding of that. Yeah, it's really hidden from us <laughs> mm. and not just our electric bodies, but our electric atmosphere, our electric environment. When COVID ended, there were, I saw so many videos of people rushing to the beach. Uh, you know, we go to the beach to recharge and because it's a, a, lots of negative ions in that environment made by the sea, the salt, the sand, we take our shoes off, we get grounded. It's really good for our electric health to be at the ocean, all, all of those things. And people were craving it because when you're inside, you're, you're not getting light, you're not getting air, you're not connected to the earth, uh, you start to droop <laughs> because <laughs> we really get our charge. I mean, most of our life force doesn't come from food. People can go weeks, months without food. I, I have some friends on Facebook that claim to be breath areas, uh, not from liquids it'd go days without liquids, but we can only go a few minutes without breath. And that's because we are breathing in a plasma charged atmosphere. We're breathing in electricity. And that is why your blood goes from being dark red to bright red, because it just got light in it. It just got electric juice. That's really mostly what we run on. Mm, it is fascinating. It's been like a real journey for me, probably over the last year. Uh, year, year to two years of sort of starting to learn some of these principles. And as you say, I think it can really start to uh, challenge some of the more well-known beliefs that we have you know there's there's so much information out there about food and nutrition and it's not that it's wrong but it's it's almost my perspective is that it dominates the scene as it were and there's so much more that we need to be aware of to help put the nutrition in its in the right piece of the puzzle so to speak yeah I remember working on a fellow who I was listening into his field and I said to him, tell me about your relationship with food. 
And he said, I force myself to eat things that are healthy. And I said, do you enjoy them? And he said, no, I just make myself eat healthy things. I was like, <laughs> I think you're missing the point here. <laughs> like, really, food should be so much about joy and pleasure and nourishment and and goodness. And unfortunately, it's become such a difficult subject. Mm. But if you're eating clean and you're still uptight, you're not you're not supporting flow in your body. If, if you're guilty or neurotic or any of these things, you're creating imbalance in your electrical system, which is going to lower the functioning of your body. It's going to lower your voltage. I used to have terrible digestion. I used to suffer from gas and bloating and indigestion and heartburn and stomach aches pretty chronically. And when I started getting tuned, it all changed because I was giving away my power. I was running myself ragged. I was running on adrenaline. If you're running on adrenaline, you are not in rest and digest. And and basically my my whole electrical system in my gut was shot from I had been bulimic for years, I had been a sugar addict for years, I'd spent so many years feeling guilty, like eating chocolate and feeling guilty and just stuck in the neurosis of food. And as long as I was in a neurotic relationship with food, and an unhealthy relationship with myself and my life, which most of us are, because mm. that's the way life, that's the path life leads us down. It's very hard to get truly healthy in this culture. And, and I'm sure you, you know, you totally get that. Yeah. Uh, but once I got my electrical system sorted out, once I understood what healthy boundaries were, I mean, the, the biofield is really uh, a macro, the micro of all the cells in your body. So if the outer boundary of this is strong and vibrant and you have good, strong electric current running through you, then that's gonna be the case all the way down in all the systems and cells of your body. And you know, at that time, mine was really weak. And so over the years, as I've gotten tuned, I've gotten to the place where I can eat anything. I, you know, And I'm on the road a lot, like I eat airplane food, airport food, buffet food at hotels for four days. Um, I eat anything and everything and I bless it so much before I eat it. I love it. I give thanks for it um, and, and happily eat it. And, you know, there's some things that I just, I won't eat. Uh, but, but for the most part, I won't eat uh, like artificial flavoring, corporate food. I do sure. try to avoid things like, um, you know, artificial sweeteners, uh, preservatives, those kinds of things are not are not good. And on the rare occasion when I have something like that, like I can feel it. So I do try to eat to the best of my ability, like whole food, local food, fresh food. Um, but I also I love all the things, you know, I love cheesy bread and I love bagels and I and I love chocolate and I can eat all of those things now without guilt. Right. So there's no emotional mm going on. There's just enjoyment um, mm -hmm. and appreciation. And, you know, I think the other thing that is really a big part of people's challenges with their guts is holding in their emotions. Right? You think about when you're a kid and you're in school and you don't want to be in school, and you don't like it, and, and you're supposed to be quiet. What happens? You get a stomach ache. <laughs> <laughs> right? And you're like, oh, that's because you're internalizing all of that discomfort. You got nowhere else to put it. You want to be outside running around, right? So what do you do? You hold it in because you're not allowed to express it. And I, I tried, I, I've become very good because biofield tuning, a big part of being electrically healthy is a lot, is recognizing your emotions and allowing them to move through you and guide you in whatever way, right? So trying to hold on to any emotion is something that I gave up years ago, but I had an incident happen about a year ago where somebody made me really angry and which doesn't happen very often. I have very long fuse. That's another part of this work because it just gives you a really long fuse, which is a nice thing to have. Uh, I tried to hold it in. I tried to hold in this anger. I didn't want to, and I immediately got a stomach ache. Like immediately, I was like, oh, my body's not gonna let me do this. I had to find a way to diplomatically and, uh, you know, healthfully express it, which I did. But I, I think that there are 
these kinds of things, these emotional restricting habits and, and overwork and giving power away, you can take supplements all day long. Mm. It's not going to fix it. This is not because yeah. <laughs> you have a wiring problem. And, you know, I've spoken to someone in the past who made the point that in, to some degree, it may be even sort of reinforcing that sort of narrative and belief systems around where our power lies, I guess, ultimately, um, which I thought was an interesting way to think about it as well. I think that's really true. I, I think that we've been really taught to look outside of ourselves for solutions. Now, when we're stuck, of course, you know, we need you. We yeah. need help of some kind or another. But at the end of the day, you're the only one who can heal you. You you really are. You are the only one who can heal you by by being determined enough to find a way to get your system regulated and to keep your system regulated. And and you're the only one who can do that. And and it isn't about waiting for everything in your life outside of you to line up and be perfectly good so that then you can finally relax. Our inner state actually determines our external circumstances much more so than the other way around. And that inner state of regulation, of self-care, of self-worth, of love of life, which I think is a really big part. You know, ultimately love heals. It's very simple. Do you love life? Do you love God? Do you love this human body that you've been given? Do you love the water that is most of what you are? The nature that composes you? And you're starlight and mud and rocks and water. You're like a tide pool, you know, in, in the starlight. Our bodies are amazing, but we've all been programmed with self-loathing that will also, like nothing's going to kill your gut faster than if you just keep hating on it. <laughs> yeah well i mean one of the big things for me in your book is there's quite a lot of emphasis around i guess our emotional well-being and the role that emotions play within our electrical bodies and within our health and i shared this on i think the previous podcast that got released whereby um i was on paternity leave in december we have our, our second son now and mum brought us around some food and she for some reason decided to bring us a sort of a, sh a shop bought uh, sticky toffee pudding. <laughs> um, and, you know, I love, I have, I have a bit of a sweet tooth at times. So we kind of, we sat there eating it. And for whatever reason, the circumstances were right that I became aware of how I was depriving myself of joy from eating this thing. And there was definitely that sort of very subtle, but for some reason I became much more aware of it, that narrative of, oh, you shouldn't enjoy this. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be eating this, especially as a nutritional therapist, there was that sort of guilt and shame there. And it, it was just a really powerful moment around what was going on within me that previously I just hadn't been fully aware of. Um, and it was so subtle, but I became even aware of how I was eating off the spoon. Like it was a very kind of trying to take this pudding off the spoon without fully engaging in the experience. Um, and what you shared earlier just kind of reminded me of, of that ultimately. But you can, I could tell how that was going to impact how I was responding to the food. In fact, it was probably the primary reason why I would have reacted to the food. Um, it's just, it goes kind of really deep ultimately, doesn't it? Yeah, it really, it really does. And if we're if we're eating with guilt, <laughs> then then you're you're just embedding that into you. Like mm -hmm. if you can feel guilty about eating it, don't eat it. <laughs> or override that and be like, I'm gonna really enjoy this and smush mm -hmm. it around in my mouth. I'm gonna be grateful for it. I'm gonna give thanks to who made it and and, mm, and I'm gonna have just the right amount so that I don't have any ill effect of it. Because mm -hmm. that's really what it's about, right? Everything is poison in the wrong dose. And I, I practice what I call moderate hedonism because I've been in that down that path of all or nothing or being good or eating clean or being really pure. And for one, it's boring. <laughs> and for two, you're denying yourself the joy of the reason why we create things like this in the first place, because they're delicious and they're fun and they give you pleasure. Uh, so I love all the pleasurable things. I love coffee, chocolate, tobacco, marijuana, alcohol. <laughs> I love all the things, ice cream. And I in, have learned how to enjoy them in small amounts so that I don't feel guilty because it's, 
because it's a small amount. And in any mm. given day, it's different. Like how much of this pleasurable substance can I comfortably metabolize in this moment? You know, every once in a while, in a great while, I can metabolize three cocktails and I have so much fun and I feel great the next day. That's rare, but you know, if, I, if the stars align and it's the right thing, then yeah. I like to be able to have the freedom to enjoy all the things without any guilt or any suffering. Mm. And I guess, you know, thinking of our, our customers, a lot of them with sort of chronic digestive issues, whereby I guess it's easy to get stuck in that rut of, this food is creating this symptom and there's, it seems to be a very obvious connection and therefore we get hyper-focused on the food because of that connection there. When again, we just need to go that little bit deeper into what's driving that in the first place. And I've, I've definitely started speaking to clients more around how food is kind of maybe just the messenger uh, that something's not quite right, but it's not the problem per se. Yeah, I would completely agree with that because once the system becomes stronger, it, it really, your digestion is electric. It's a electrical fermentation that's stripping the electrons from the food and, and sending that light, the same light that's in the, in the air. That's why we want to, from an electrical perspective, we want to eat foods that degrade quickly because they have the most available light in them, like things like berries. Uh, mostly fruit and meat, which is how what my body runs best on is fruit and meat. And that has the most available electric juice, if you will. Okay. Juicy foods. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> that I think, you know, but everybody's different. And, and that's the thing too, that I think makes food hard is mm. that you live in different climates, you have different lifestyles, you have different things available for you in any given moment. It's, yeah. you really have to learn intuitive eating in, in order to, to navigate food and under, you know, get rid of the addictions and compulsions because those are all emotional. Any kind of addiction or compulsion you have around food, you're dealing with, an, you're masking an emotion, you're managing an emotion with food or with your deprival of yourself of food. Um, it's most, it really is mostly emotional. And it's because we've all been raised in a culture of suppression. You know, boys aren't allowed to get angry. Or, you know, boys are allowed to get angry. Girls aren't allowed to get angry. Boys aren't allowed to get sad. Mm -hmm. And so we end up judging and suppressing all of our emotions. And when you just think about suppressing any emotion, where does it go? goes in your gut. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And, and we can have a whole pile, huge backlogs. I know that I was a sugar addict and I managed anger with sugar. I grew up the youngest of six. My anger was totally impotent. Whenever I, I got upset, I would go for sugar. There's a, there's a picture of me. I'm probably like almost two years old and I'm lying on the floor of the pantry and I have a giant box of Lucky Charms open next to me. I look like a little stuffed doll. You know, I clearly gone upset about something, toddled into the pantry and just stuffed myself with Lucky Charms into a carb coma, I'm just lying on the floor there. And I did that for years, years, years. It was really hard to uh, start managing this deep backlog of anger that I had never let myself feel. Because when you start to take away those foods that you've been managing emotions with, those emotions start coming up. Right. And if, you, if you're not prepared for them or you don't know what to do with them, you're just going to try to stuff them back down because that's what everybody told you to do. Mm. So with the, with the therapy, when someone is, is in a session, what sort of awareness do they have? Do they, are there, do, do emotions come to the surface? Do they, how sort of obvious or subtle is it for the, the client, so to speak? Uh, what, sometimes when people ask me what it is I do, I say, I make people cry. <laughs> <laughs> I take big, strong guys that haven't cried in 10 years and just like make them cry like that. Uh, we're really, I mean, not everybody, but we're, what we're really doing is poking around in your memory banks okay. and, and poking around for those tender places where, um, where there's sound stuck that you didn't express. So, you know, everybody's different. Every session is different, mm, right? Okay. And that's important to understand. And everybody's outcome is really different. Sometimes it can be like so profound and life-changing. Sometimes it can be like, 
I didn't feel anything, right? Mm -hmm. So it's important, like biofield tuning is really helpful with a lot of things. It's certainly not a be all cure all for everything. Like it, it doesn't touch cancer at all. Like I wish it did, but it really doesn't. Oh. Uh, once things have gone really deeply into the body, it sort of goes out of our domain. Um, but when things are still in the imbalanced energy phase and it hasn't drilled in, into the body, then we can be really effective or things that are rhythmic like anxiety. But so every person who's receiving has a different experience. If you're very quiet inside and very somatically aware, you can absolutely feel energy moving and it can feel really weird. <laughs> uh, if you're very disconnected and numb, you might not sense anything at all. Uh, that's why, you know, I put weighted forks on people and I get them at the beginning of a session, mm. like, I want to get you out of your head and down into this somatic experience. So you can tell when I'm working, when I hit a particular memory in your field, where you're feeling it in your body, what you're noticing. So we can bring attention to that tension pattern and, and be with it as it relaxes and releases and a bigger breath comes in and more space opens up right when that block lets go. It's right. better to be aware of it than not. Okay. Uh, sometimes you, the sound is super, super obvious. Uh, I worked on a friend, first time I worked on him, and I was going through his field and all of a sudden we hit a spot where the fork got so wonky sounding. Like I, I could obviously hear it, but he, he heard it too. He's like, wow, that sounds really <laughs> weird. He's like, where is that? And so I, I charted it on the timeline and I said, this is around 18. And he said, oh, that's when I went through the windshield of a car. Wow. Right. So you think about like <laughs> that experience of going through the windshield of a car, how disruptive it is to all of the electrical signaling in your body. Uh, and so just by staying in that spot, his, he unwound this whole deep pattern of tension that he'd been holding ever since then. Mm. Just by me holding a fork, you know, four feet away from him. Is his old body started to do this? We got off the table. He's standing differently. Amazing. Yeah. Um, you talk another thing you talk about in your book is sort of, I guess, the role of light, and in some ways, we're sort of light beings, and um, I think it's the sort of the bio photons that you talk about at some point. Um, is there something you can kind of just expand on in regards to this as well? I did a little quote on my Instagram and it sort of definitely was resonating with people. <laughs> so um, I think people would love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, when I first started moving through the field and encountering resistance, and then discovering that if I stayed there, the resistance would let go. But then it was like I was left with sort of what felt to me like a magnetic blob that I could stick a fork in and move, right? I called it click, drag, and drop. And like. <laughs> Here's a blob and I'm going to move it here like a magnetic stylus, you know, in a pile of iron filings. And I was so confused about what it was that I was moving. I didn't understand it, mm. right? Like, what is this? This is so odd. Uh, I, I, I came across some information about how when an organism is under stress, it leaks light, it leaks biophotons. So they have biophoton cameras where they can take a leaf and cut it and you see all this light kind of leaking out from the cut. Uh, so in, in stressful times in our lives, we lose light <laughs> because we're, we're giving it off because we're stressed, right? Think about that car accident, like he lost a whole bunch of biophotons. But when we, when we lose these biophotons, they don't just drift away into the environment they actually stay in our field. And as I was learning the combing process and discovering that I was finding traumatic memories, it made me think of the shamanic concept of soul retrieval and this idea that whenever someone suffers a big trauma, like a piece of their soul breaks off and stays there in the past. And a shaman will go back into the past and find that soul piece, soul retrieval, and will bring it back to the body and will blow or place it in the body like 
I was doing with my forks. So I realized that I was doing a kind of sonic soul retrieval and I was finding these bits of self that had been left behind and picking them back, getting them on the bus basically and bringing them back into now. I would say there's there is a, a light component to so photons, if you will, but really in this world of waves, there really aren't any particles <laughs> uh, as far as I can tell, but we use this language because we don't really have anything else um, that there are also phonons, which is the sound equivalent of a, a, a discrete particle of light, a discrete particle of sound. And I realized that so much of what is here is trapped sound. It is the, the parts of you that didn't get expressed, that went into like a breath hold that maybe wanted to scream or cry or emote or express in some way, but didn't. And so, so we've left all these bits of ourselves in light and sound behind us in our past. And this is really what aging is, right? It's this loss of light. It's this loss of vitality. Uh, being electrically healthy is about being having radiant health because you've gathered back your photons and your own lumens have gone up. When people become very ill, their their voltage drops considerably. Mm. Right? When people get a gray pallor. You can really see somebody who's radiantly alive and somebody who's just you know the battery, the flashlight you pulled out of the drawer and turned it on, and the lights really dim because the voltage has gotten low. Yeah. So, so that, and, and there's information, right? So I would call these photons and phonons energy and information. And even if they're trapped in a particularly traumatic or difficult time, they aren't bad. <laughs> it's not like we're going back through all the difficulties of your life and like dumping it back into you. So now you've got, you know, all that stuff I wanted to forget. No, it was maybe held in a pattern of information that was difficult, but fundamentally it's just energy. It's light, it's sound. And now we're bringing it back into flow so that you just have more energy. Mm -hmm. One of the things that can happen after a session is what I used to call a detox response, but I now call it cleaning response. And that is when we've had a lot of tension and stagnation and compartmentalization in our body and we get an adjustment and all of a sudden energy starts flowing. It's like the garbage trucks are getting into neighborhoods that they couldn't get into before. And the body can go through a release of mucus, of you know bathroom <laughs> experiences, waves of emotion, um, physical pain, weird dreams. Uh, it can it can actually be uncomfortable. And some people, when they receive the work and then they have a very uncomfortable day the next day, uh, get kind of bent because they're under this impression that that their own you know that the path to healing is just expansive and beautiful mm -hmm. and nothing else. <laughs> Uh, but in biofield tuning, we say better out than in. And when I first started getting tuned by my very first students in 2010, uh, I was very compartmentalized, had a lot of damp stagnation in my body. And it all started moving and I started producing copious amounts of mucus for like a oh. month. I lost seven pounds and it was mostly mucus, <laughs> um, you know, which is really unpleasant to go through. Mm. <laughs> But the the result of that is, is that I'm 55 years old. I don't have any health issues at all. I can eat whatever I want. I sleep great. I have high energy throughout the day um, because my cells are all really clean. Like my body is really clean because I've gotten out all of this stagnation and emotional backlog and uh, hidey holes where I stuffed, you know, that emotion that I wasn't allowed to express. <laughs> And those, all those corners have been cleaned out. So if, the reason why I call it a cleaning response is because you either clean the inside or if you don't have that kind of response, you very often go and clean outside because now that your voltage is up and your signal is a little clearer, that pile of clutter that you couldn't deal with for however long, now suddenly you're like, wow, I have the energy to bust that clutter. I have the energy to finish that project. I have the energy to vacuum my car, whatever it is, you tend to just up level the orderliness within and without. Mm, that's so interesting and really resonates, I think, with different interventions I've used over the years, I guess. There is that 
ones that have worked, I guess, there is that sort of just increase in energy that, as you say, allows you to get some stuff done that you haven't, you just left there sometimes for a very long time. Um, that's really interesting. I guess, you know, you're using words that um, people will be familiar with, but I think there's, there's such depth to some of this, you know, this idea of cells and voltage, like, I think is just important to reiterate the fact that we know this is um, sort of a matter of fact, and it's another way that we can consider sort of cellular health ultimately. Um, I think I've read some stuff around researchers that have looked at the voltage of cells and, you know, there is that sort of hierarchy of cancer cells being extremely low compared to people, I think with chronic fatigue syndrome got measured. Um, it's just more kind of evidence around this electrical side of us. It's generally accepted at this point in the medical field that the body has electricity in it. They don't acknowledge the electrical system, nor do they acknowledge magnetic fields. But we learned in grade school that anything that has electric current running through it has a magnetic field around it. And the human body is no different. It's your aura. Like, <laughs> it's your electrical system. Like, we don't need to debate this. It's mm. self-evident. And I think that it's been propagandized into pseudoscience and sort of people have been Jedi mind tricked into uh, not seeing what's really there. Because most people know that their brain waves are electric or that their heartbeat is electric. And that like what you said, more and more people are becoming hip to the sort of cellular voltage and it all points to a system that yeah. it, you're kind of looking at the the trees and not seeing the forest. Yeah. And I think, am I right in saying that you talk of sort of about the importance of sort of the fascia um, as kind of a key, if I, I might be wrong with this term, but kind of conductive system, as it were? Yeah, our fascia conducts light. It, our fascia is a lot like the mycelial network in the soil mm. in that it, it connects everything. It helps everything to hang together. It delivers nutrition, information, light. Uh, and and connectivity. So I would say that we say the skin is the largest organ, but I would say that fascia, I don't know if we call it an organ, but it's definitely the biggest network, singular network in the whole body. And the and we can get very bound up in our fascia, which will create inflammation. Mm. Uh, I actually created a tuning fork to help, to help with that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is one called the sonic slider. It's got a really long handle. And when you activate this, so this is based in the Earth's natural background electromagnetic resonance, also known as the Schumann resonance, mm. which is around 7.83 hertz. And that's our brain in an alpha brainwave state, a place of sort of all meditative, listening, not actively thinking, uh, sort of a being uh, uh. brainwave state. And so when we when we go out in nature and we meditate and our brain waves link up with the Earth's background pulse and we experience a sense of unity, consciousness, connection, all of that, you can't make a 7.83 hertz tuning fork because it would be about four feet long. Like the lower <laughs> the frequency, the longer the fork. Okay. So I made uh, 7.83 times 12. So this is 93.96 hertz and it's got that 7.83 embedded in it. And Perfect. I have people activate this fork and you can just hold it on yourself, um, you know, or any place where you're sore or anything like that. But the, the best part of this fork is that you can slide it on yourself. Oh. And when you slide it on your whole body, like when you get out of the shower, you just slide it up towards the heart. It helps to release fascia knots. It helps to keep the fascia fluid and moving. So it gets blood, lymph, fascia, everything's stimulated and moving and uh it's a super useful tool because mm. people use it for all kinds of stuff actually people use it with the boot uh to improve their digestion i've had a lot of people tell me that they have spent time every day running sound into all their digestive organs they hang out with their liver they go to their stomach their spleen their pancreas follow the small intestine follow the large intestine what are you doing? You're adding tone and rhythm, right? And we talk about digestive tone, we talk mm -hmm. about digestive rhythm. So when we add to that tone and rhythm with a, with a frequency that's already based in nature, 
um, it stimulates the functionality of the digestive organs. So um, that's that's also an option for people. Amazing. Um, I'm mindful of time. Is there is there anything we haven't touched on, Eileen, that you would like to sort of bring into today's conversation? Well, in addition to working with tuning forks, I also do work with voice. And I think that voice is a really great sound healing tool because it's free, <laughs> it's extremely <laughs> portable. And ultimately it is by our word that we create our life. It's by our word that we make ourselves sick or we make ourselves well. Our words are very, very impactful, our thoughts as well on the water <laughs> that is in us. I think a lot of people, I don't know if you're familiar with Veda Austin, she's been doing some incredible work with water and freezing it kind of like Emoto did, but mm. uh, sort of a, a different approach. And they've done work with jars of rice. So this is a kid's school project where you take three jars of cooked rice and every day the kids go up to one jar and they're like, we love you. And then they go to this other jar and they go, we hate you. And then they ignore a third jar. And the jar that is loved doesn't get moldy. But the ones that are hated and that are ignored do. You are the rice, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's so much of uh, of of whether something is is healthy is has to do with it being loved. So it's really important that we use our voice to to be loving to ourselves, to be kind, to be nourishing, to be uh, constructive right not punitive or judgmental or unkind because because those things really do hurt and they do have an effect uh so words and the words we choose to use certainly have a pretty significant impact on us but in addition to mapping the biofield anatomy um and the sort of the terrain around the body i also have worked with two australian brothers named isaac and troll corin and we've created what we call the sonic anatomy, which is a collection of about 40 different sounds. And there sounds like babies make, like wa, ga, gu, gi, ma, pa. But they resonate in very specific areas inside the body. Sure. And we teach this in a program called Sing the Body Electric, where we bring people through what we call the tones, demitones, and zones of the sonic anatomy. And it's just a, a practice of exploring your human instrument and discovering it like babies do with curiosity with there's nothing that you can do that's wrong or out of tune or off pitch and it's an incredibly opening uh liberating series of exercises to do with the voice because it brings you it brings your voice into your body and you can resonate different areas with your with your voice like just for example let's say somebody has an issue with elimination constipation sluggishness in there the tone for the large intestine is low low and you can actually like move that around you move it up the ascending across the transverse and down the descending just with your intention and your imaginations so you don't even need a tuning fork what i said you could do with the sonic slider and the boot you can actually do from the inside with your own voice wow <laughs> basically give yourself a sound massage from the inside and when you spend an hour moving sound all around inside of you and breathing deeply like you feel incredible on the other side you feel alive and energized and embodied um so i really love that work it's really changed my singing voice it's opened up whole new dimensions really for me um because again coming back to the stradivarius uh, example most of us have been pretty beat up and mm -hmm. you can't sit down at a at an instrument that's been beat up and never tuned and expect it to make beautiful music is not gonna and that's why so many people are so self-conscious and uncomfortable with their voices because our voice reflects everything that's going on in you everything that's ever gone on in you is in your voice and so this is a way of going in there and tuning up your instrument getting your instrument in tune we don't even sing you know at the beginning of this workshop we have everybody sing happy birthday because everybody can sing happy birthday <laughs> they, they sing happy birthday to themselves and then we spend like 
seven hours making baby sounds together <laughs> and then and then we sing happy birthday again at the end and everyone is so much more soulful and playful and they enjoy it and they're like oh my god i can sing like mm -hmm. you just needed to get tuned up inside yeah. uh, so i really love that work um we have some live appearances coming up we do regular online workshops okay and, uh, yeah I, I i really i have this fantasy of like being in a stadium and getting like thirty thousand people to free their <laughs> voices and then sing together like that's just that's huge brilliant. medicine right there yeah and i mean that really resonates i think i've started to appreciate that if you want to if you're kind of stuck in your health then rather than sort of listening to what's happening on social media and all these different things is kind of just to observe like life and the world and you can you can start to pick up quite a lot from that I think and what you just shared there I've always been curious that I love to sing and my voice can fluctuate a lot in regards to its sort of quality for one of a better way of putting it and I've always wondered sort of why like what's going on there that where so which can influence it so much um, so what you've shared there makes makes a lot of sense and resonates for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I th I think that there's few greater joys or pleasures, honestly, than singing with other people. As humans, mm -hmm. we're really designed to be musical together. And in this day and age, people don't go to church, you know, to sing like they used to. Uh, a lot of popular music isn't conducive i don't know there's just yeah. there's music could be used as much more powerful medicine than it's currently being used yeah well i find music is definitely the sort of at the, certainly the moment in the last year it's been the thing that without fail will move me like i can literally i will feel energy rise up emotion coming very quickly with the right song um and it's just i think as you say it's an incredibly powerful tool that um we could all use a lot more probably yeah absolutely you know i just want to share this one last thought mm. uh, my husband is a master of the material realm you know i'm sort of master of the immaterial realm but he works with with metal and wood and stone and uh he said to me the other day that you can't shift a material from one state to another state without some kind of energy input and sound and music are energy inputs that shift our state, right? So sitting around meditating by yourself, you're not adding any kind of different energy. And I think sometimes when people think that that meditation or even like eating clean is going to somehow shift their state, they really need music or sound. <laughs> they need some kind of energy input. Mm. And, uh, and that really that is what changes stuff i mean you just said it yourself and i don't think there's a person listening who has not used music to shift their state you know yeah. so this is we all already know this anyway yeah it is instinctive i think ultimately isn't it and i think that feeling that is sort of experience just sort of really shows shows me sort of just where we might need to go you know dance and movement I think would be another one that can really just sort of shift the state and I'm trying to think of that quote you know if, I can't remember what it is now but something along the lines of you know if you haven't laughed danced listened to music before going to the doctor then that's where you should start kind of <laughs> kind of quotes um, it's true it's true I mean sometimes you can't muster the gumption to to do that but I'll tell you what it's unlikely that going to the doc that the doctor is going to give you something that makes you want to sing and dance quite mm. frankly <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nicely put. I mean maybe you guys have good stuff I I I'm my sense is is that you do but certainly uh tra traditional medicine and and drugs I mean, a drug is just a toxin that your body has to process that may or may not help. Mm. Uh, but but your voice is right there, and uh, and you know the radio is right there. Yeah. So well, it's like <laughs> yeah, it's like what you said earlier. I've said it to clients for quite a few years now. This idea, you know, how deeply embedded is the the dysfunction, the imbalance, and I think that has such a profound impact on how how intensive the the therapy needs to be how long it might take to get better but i think sometimes we got things deeply embedded and the things we're doing to try and restore our health are kind of it's not that they don't work but they're not 
they're not going deep enough into what needs to be got into if that makes sense yeah and that's a really good point because how old you are the severity and duration definitely plays a role in your recovery like i love working with the 17 to 24 age group because they're old enough to have a clue but their patterns will shift very quickly mm. very quickly you know i can pull them out of a ditch and they stay out but if i'm working with somebody who's 80 who's had generations of dysfunctional patterning and 80 years of dysfunctional patterning it's that's heavy lifting it's just going to take a while it's going to take a while and i i think one of the mistakes that a lot of people make when they're on the road to health is that they're looking for a quick fix they're looking for a miracle and they want something you know that's going to be that and the fact of the matter is is that real healing takes time it does it takes time to build a new pattern inside of yourself mm -hmm. To, to dismantle the pain body, to build up the light body. I can't come in and take away your pain body if you haven't made any investments in your own experience of your radiant light body. You don't, you don't have the circuits, you don't have the wiring. It's really a process of rewiring um, that takes time. Yeah. And, and, and you're the only one who can keep you on that track of one step at a time. Uh, stop looking for the miracle because that that doesn't really it's it's a futile search and you get nowhere if you just settle in and realize that you've got to repattern your whole experience of yourself, and you can like this is really doable um, i've seen people have very dramatic changes in just three sessions um, but the but obviously the more tuned somebody gets, i mean i've had probably thousands of sessions at this point, I'm like the most tuned person on the <laughs> planet, but we can still find areas of dissonance in me and have a whole lifetime and a whole culture and all my ancestral stuff. Mm -hmm. We're really living in a very corrupted, dissonant part of the human timeline. And there's nothing wrong with any of us as individuals. It's not our fault. We just popped out into this part of the space time continuum in a really messy place. And it's really hard. It's a, it's a, it's a Herculean effort to become radiantly healthy, but it's absolutely mm. worth it. Yeah. And what you say there again, I think is so profound and at the same time, very subtle in some of the importance, this idea of something I'm not sure I'm going to be able to articulate very well, but there's a mindset, I think, to healing. Um, and I think we've all most, if not all of us, have been conditioned to kind of want to be fixed from some sort of external source, which is understandable. But also we often try and get well by focusing on the things that we don't want. Um, and that could be a symptom even, for example. And I think sort of flipping that to sort of what you've been talking about, kind of cultivating health, resilience, you know, you could put all sorts of different words there, but sort of moving more towards creating health rather than necessarily trying to reverse or prevent or get rid of this symptom that is causing us distress i think that's kind of a subtle really big energetic shift that is important absolutely one of the key parts of biofield tuning once you get the noise out of the signal is amplifying the true tone okay. that's underneath you know, amplifying because we're all amazing we're all built for harmony we're all wired for brilliance to have a human body is an amazing thing and and it's really just about taking care of your body the way that it needs to be taken care of your body needs enough sleep you know you're not gonna like if you think about your body as a pet you know what i mean like if you have a horse you're not gonna go throw a pizza in its stall and then follow it up with a pint of ice cream like that's abusive like that's terrible you're not gonna like not exercise i mean obviously some people will but our bodies really are like pets and just like we our pets need love and they need other animals and they need walks and they need, you know they need all the things if you start to treat your body like a pet and love it like a pet and give it what it needs as a pet it it becomes a really different kind of experience mm. I like that. I like that. Treat your body like a pet. <laughs> um, Eileen, thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing your journey, your work, everything that you've kind of developed. I think it's incredible. Um, I'm really looking forward to sharing this conversation and, and personally diving more into kind of your work and what you do as well. So thank you. 
Excellent. Thank you, Alex. This was fun. <laughs>